All right. Um, nice to see so many people here today. Welcome, everyone. Uh, first, we need to inform you that uh, this uh, lecture will be broadcasted and taped and uh, afterwards put on YouTube. And uh, you might be caught on camera. And if you have, a, if you are going to ask any questions, your voice will be recorded and that's also personal data. And if you want to know how we handle these kind of personal data and so on and so forth, please contact me or any other one in the organizing team. That's a, that's that. <laughs> so today we have the pleasure to have to listen to uh, to get the opportunity to listen to Professor Francisco Aguilera, and uh, you will do a talk about uh, if uh, there's a possible way to reduce uh, tropical forest degradation. Yeah. So uh, please. Thanks, take the floor. and thanks for having me. And it's a real pleasure to to have you um, here today, and for me to have the opportunity to visit with you. Uh, I joined SLU uh, just about a year ago. Um, it's been a real pleasure to, to join the Department of Forest Economics. And in addition to being on the Department of Forest Economics, I wear another hat as a deputy director for the Center of Environmental and Resource Economics, which is a joint venture between um, the Department of Forest Economics here at SLU and the Department of Economics at uh, UMU University. So it's a real pleasure to be in that role, and we're celebrating 10 years of SETE uh, this year. So it's, it's a great accomplishment, and it's a pleasure for me to join such a selective group. So can money and management uh, reduce the likelihood of degradation? That's one a question that I will pose, uh, pose to you today. And uh, you'll get an answer from me, but I'm actually more interested in looking at the answer from you. So what do you think? Do you think that money can really change and prevent degradation? Can management can prevent degradation? Can they both of them together help reduce that? And I will start the, um, my talk highlighting some of the challenges that we face today in terms of degradation in the context of deforestation. Um, but then I'll put on my hat as an economist and I'll give you what I think about this question. But I'm very much interested in learning about what you think. Probably in your mind you think about deforestation and it's a very acute, very dramatic change in land use. We are removing forest, trees, covered, and putting in something else. So this is a picture I took in Liberia this summer. Um, people come in to harvest the timber, uh, t trees that have timber value, you remove that. Uh, you turn, uh, you fire uh, the land, you burn it. Uh, one of the objectives is to add some amendments to the soil so you can see the little kind of charred color things in the doo -doo -doo. over here. So there is a little bit of an amendment uh, when it comes to uh, soil amendments. Uh, you will have coming in, bringing in some crops, could be beans, could be pineapples even for as a cash crop. Uh, and then if the soil is really bad, people will start planting cassava. But you have moved away from a forest covered land to something that's definitely not forest. So that's a very acute system of deforestation. Uh, probably you heard about it in the news, a big challenge in parts of Brazil, definitely in parts of Africa, uh, in Asia as well, with oil palm, oil palm covers uh, being moved away from forest to, to oil palm farming. Uh, so deforestation is certainly a big, big challenge. But one challenge that we have a tendency to overlook is that of degradation. It's not as dramatic. It's more of a chronic problem. It's more of a long-term process. So you start seeing a uh, few species disappear, few trees being harvested. And in the long term, you have this destruction, this extirpation of species over time, and overall, the degradation of the system. So I took this picture over uh, in, uh, in Malawi. That's uh, Maggie Muntali, and uh, this is uh, Minwitsi National Forest in Malawi. And this is taken for about a, a year ago. And what you can see here is the stamp. Uh, this is sort of a stump over here. And it actually looks very fresh. Hopefully Unfortunately, the light is not the best here. Um, but we were walking in, and you hear the machete is going tuck, 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 because people are chopping down these trees. And then you chop the trees, you chop, chop the, uh, the wood, and then they dig these holes, they put the wood in, they start a fire, they cover it with dirt, and that's how you make charcoal in many developing countries. Um, so when we were walking in, people were running away from us. In fact, the little area that to your right over here, that's a pit that has just been harvested. They had just taken the charcoal out, put it in sacks, and 
just run away. Now, that's what you see in terms of degradation. There are species that have a specific value and they're harvested, they're collected. It's more of a long-term chronic, cr chronic process. Um, and something that it's a challenge when it comes to um, policy assessment or the evaluation of impacts is that while well, we can use satellites to really tease out the difference between forest land to non-forest land, satellite information might not be the best when it comes to distinguishing degradation. It's a slower process, right? Even some of the canopies in those remaining trees can come back and actually they can challenge the ability to really distinguish between what is what is not forest. So when it comes to degradation and long, ample assessments of, of their impacts over land, it's, it's a much more challenging issue that we are facing. So in terms of degradation and deforestation, yes, deforestation turns to be the most talked about topic. We have lost about 1% of uh, forests over the, uh, 25 years, from 1990 to 2015. It doesn't sound like much, but in fact, uh, there are two, a couple nuances there. Uh, the first one is, is net losses. That's how the Food and Agriculture Organization looks at it. So you can have planted forests, which are very different from primary forests, uh, and that count as forests. So the net loss is the net loss including planted forests. Uh, most of the losses taking place in Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and parts of Southeast Asia as well. But the one thing that probably catches your eye today, and that's why it's this the focus of my talk, is that when we look at carbon emissions associated with disturbances of forests, deforestation and degradation, in fact, about 70% of those emissions come from degradation. So deforestation might be more obvious when you look at these fires and the big smoke. It's more visual. But degradation is, in fact, that chronic thing that is depleting the soils and the diversity in those forests, and it's a silent killer of those, of those forests. So degradation has become, in fact, a more challenging issue today than deforestation might be. And so, as a society, we devise policy instruments trying to fix this problem. So, in back in 2008, the United Nations came up with a program to reduce emissions from deforestation and degradation. That's red with two Ds. And under that umbrella, we have had a number of country-based programs that have been instituted to try to add value, to compensate forest owners, change their behavior so people do not engage in degradation and deforestation. A few examples, uh, the first one uh, from Costa Rica Red Plus program has actually historically been designed to compensate some forest owners to protect water quality. So the specific service that's being paid for is how forests can protect water quality. In this actually, in the case of Costa Rica, how around hydroelectric power plants, the prevention or the good management of forests prevents sedimentation if tho in those hydropower facilities. So their forest owners are being paid so that that doesn't happen. In other countries, like it is the case of uh, um, Mexico, Conafi 4, or um, Brazil, we can think of Bolivia as well, uh, their forest owners are compensated to protect the forest. So they're not being paid for a service like water quality or the prevention of erosion, but you're actually being paid to protect the forest altogether. And comes in another flavor too. Some of these programs actually make a very clear emphasis that the objective, yes, indeed, is to protect the environment, but the bigger objective is to deal with poverty. I mean, many of these countries are low-income countries or developing countries. And some of these programs like Bolsa uh, Familia, Bolsa Floresta in Brazil, do have that specific component that we want to invest in people. And so it's kind of a money transfer exercise to protect, to uh, reduce poverty, but at the same time, protect the environment. So it comes in different flavors, but all of them are sort of covered under this umbrella of United Nations Red. As an economist, well, we see this sort of a little bit of a transaction. Um, there is a forest owner, could be a community, could be an individual, and that person or that community receives a payment on the condition that they will engage in a different type of behavior. So they will not change land use, they will not engage in harvesting specific species and prevent degradation in that way. So it's sort of straightforward, you have that exchange. I pay you, you protect, but that has to be checked. I mean, we're all good people, right? We're all, we do engage in things in good faith, but if, no, if there are no check and balances, the system can be corrupted, right? So uh, can these programs, can these legally binding programs, can these contracts between agencies and landowners 
can they prevent degradation or not? That's a bigger question. Conceptually works. It should be, it's very straightforward. It's a transaction, you have a binding uh, exercise, you have a paper, a contract sign in. So, do they really work? And so what the next few slides that I will present um, are based on some research that we conducted in Ecuador. Uh, this is within the Amazon basin in Ecuador, so you can picture a uh, rainforest, um, a close, kind of close canopy, primary forest, uh, very diverse, very humid, very remote. So we estimated uh, the differences between conditions in forests that were enrolled under the Ecuadorian Socio Bosque program, so it's one of these payment for conservation programs, and how they compare again uh, against lands that were not enrolled in that program. So how do they compare? And this is sort of the, some of the main messages that we found. Uh, we uh, actually went in, we, ha we had a, uh, four different crews. Um, we surveyed nearly eight hectares of tropical forest, and that's a lot, in fact, when you think about it. Uh, over 5,000 trees measured, uh, all above uh, uh, DBH uh, of 10 centimeters or higher. So that's a, that was a lot of work. Um, but the first <coughs> element that I want to point is this one over here. So in, in green, we have the forests that are enrolled in the government program. It pays to prevent, uh, prevent degradation and deforestation. And in blue color, we have non-enrolled forests. And this is after we have done some exercises with randomization um, of, of these two treatments. So on average, the forests that were enrolled under this payment contract had two more species than areas that were not enrolled in the program. So two species over se seven and a half hectares, well, probably doesn't sound like much, right? But if we think about the landscape, a whole Amazon basin, two more species is quite a, quite a bit uh, when we look at the landscape level. So it doesn't sound like much, but it could be translated over a lot of benefits over a large, large landscape. The bigger difference that we found was in terms of the presence of commercial trees, species that have a commercial timber value. The program had twice as many trees with timber value than the lands that were not participating in the very same program. So that's where we found the biggest effect. And this actually makes a lot of sense in the sense that um, it's usually the timber value that creates these markets for harvesting these individual trees. It will not change the canopy, but people go in and harvest individual trees. And trees at risk of extinction, actually we found about a 50% greater likelihood that within areas that were under the conservation program, you find 50% of the time more uh, trees that are at, uh, at the risk of extinction. And this is based on definitions from the International Union of Nature uh, Conservation. So if these capture some of the biophysical side of things, uh, we also did a little bit of an experiment. And we asked people, roughly, the currently, uh, the you can receive payments between $40, $50 an hectare. So you're somewhere around here, OK? And we asked people, what happens if we raise the payment to $60 per hectare per year, 80 100 over all the way to $180 per hectare? The first thing that I want to bring your attention to is look at this, at this trend. When we increase the payment, and this is captures the numbers of refusals, people who didn't want to take the payment. I don't want to be enrolled in this program. The number of refusals went up when we increased payment levels. Doesn't quite make sense. Why do you think people would say, no, I don't want to participate in a program, although the program is willing to pay me more? Why do you think people will, s will respond in that fashion? Yeah. Probably they're saying, oh, they're willing to pay me more because ah, the, my, my timber has a lot of value. Shouldn't be in, and therefore, I shouldn't be enrolling with them. Very good point. What else? Why would people decline their participation, even though you're willing to pay them more for conservation? Absolutely. For those of us who come from, from developing countries, and I was born in Ecuador, where th this research took place, you have this kind of risk aversion and suspicion of government. Like, why does this government want to pay me more? 
And if it's conditional payment, it's legally binding. And if I have an emergency, I uh, have a hospital bill to pay for, and I have to harvest some trees, and I have to violate the contract, the government will come back and they requ require repayment of all the money that they have paid me previously. So it's like, I don't want to get into that business. Uh, absolutely right. So those two very, very, po very points capture exactly why people responded in that fashion. Eventually, once you get to, get to a certain level, people will agree because there's so much money involved. So uh, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, so that's the first one when it comes to refusals. And the other thing is I added a line here capturing the individuals who are at high risk. So these are persons who have previously engaged in some kind of illegal ma management. So they respond. The message is people do respond to higher payments, uh, but some of them might initially uh, show sort of an opposite direction. Then we did an experiment. We, we social scientists like to do experiments, and we ask people, okay, what do you think if we change the program a little bit? And out of the three attributes I include here, the one that carried the biggest weight, the biggest effect in terms of people stated preference, saying, yes, I would like to participate in such a new program, was that of management allowance. The way the program is currently instituted prevents any kind of management. Nothing can be harvested for commercial purposes, period. You might be able to harvest non-timber products, but beyond that, it's not allowed. So the biggest attribute that had the biggest effect in terms of the people's stated willingness to participate in such a program was management. So it is worth knowing, and this is sort of the bottom message of, and the punchline for, for my talk today. When you think about for tropical degradation, be aware that actually this is having a greater impact on society than deforestation does. Much of the emissions coming from degradation exceed already those of deforestation. And the impacts of degradation goes beyond the canopy. The canopy can be closed, but the composition of the, of the forest might be degraded altogether. Can we pay forest owners so they don't engage in such practices? Yes, we can. And in fact, it shows that such level of monetary compensation can re result in a change of behavior. But money paid to individuals, to families, will not be enough. If payments were to be com um, combined with some level of management, that would be, I'm sorry, I've spent 15 years in the US, but a silver bullet uh, that can help really have wonderful and tremendous impact in terms of prevented degradation and deforestation if we allow some degree of management in addition to some level of monetary compensation. So, and why does this work? Economies head on. We're adding value. We're adding value to that timberland. We're adding value to those forests. So people are actually more likely to engage in sustainable forest management by having a management plan, by having some level of compensation, and therefore we're actually more likely to prevent uh, the destruction of those forests. For those who are interested in more details, there are two papers that we uh, published last year uh, in ecological economics and land use policy. Um, and to come back for a circle, so what do you think after my talk? Can money and management reduce tropical deforestation? Who says the de definitive yes? So raise your hand. Okay. Who says no? Who says maybe? Me too. Actually, that's what the numbers say, yes, indeed, money compensation, payments for conservation can reduce degradation, and so can management. <sighs> but the skeptical economist in me so will have to say maybe. And here is where, we, this is my call to all of you, um, especially my colleagues here at the SLU. I'm not necessarily advocating for management, per se. Because tropical forest management within primary forests is extremely difficult. I don't have the skills to do that. So my ecologist colleagues, my biological colleagues, um, this is a great opportunity to work together. When we look at what management is truly sustainable so that we can recommend that, well, this kind of silvicultural approach could prevent the degradation of these forests. And combined with some money tools, well, maybe we can make a real impact in society. So that's my call to you today. As a social scientist talking to my natural base science uh, colleagues, like, this is a great opportunity to work together and make a definitive impact on many of the challenging uh, issues we're facing today. 
I want to close my talk by facing my former grad student, uh, Phil Mohevalin, who is currently at the U.S. Uh, Census. Uh, the Department of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture in the U.S. have provided a fair amount of funding for this. And I cannot thank enough uh, colleagues at the uni Universidad Estatal Amazonica who have all the knowledge to identify all these species. I can have three lives together and won't be able to have the knowledge and the expertise to identify these trees myself. I will never be able to do that. So much of the work that I presented today was possible to them, and I cannot thank them enough. And with that, I think my worth knowing session is up, and I appreciate you coming. Uh, we welcome any questions you might have during now or during, during uh, soup time. So, but thanks again for coming. It's a real pleasure. Yes, thank you very much. Very interesting. And I'm sure there are many questions. So if you want, want to ask a question to Francisco, uh, I will pass the mic. I see you have one question here. You didn't say much about the type of landowners or forest owners, because that <coughs> probably a quite large vari variety in that. How much does that influence the Thanks, Anders. Uh, so in that regard, this research focuses entirely on individual family owners. Uh, the program targets community-owned lands and individual owners too. So that's the first distinction. This one covered only individual family owners. The reason, one of the reasons for that is much easier to identify who is the decision maker within the household. In a community, the interactions can be very challenging. So for the sake of an empirical application, that was one reason why we focused on them. Um, so that opens another line of research, is the dynamics and the context of how institutional work, peer-to-peer -peer interactions, trust, and other things, how that, that social capital can influence or prevent uh, degradation and deforestation. Absolutely. I wonder how long uh, uh, the social bosque program has been in this area that you... Yes, so some are as old as 2009, some of the contracts. So we had a preconditions that to be in a treatment group of enrollment, people had to be enrolled uh, by 2010. And we collected the data in 2014. So oh. um, thank you. Uh, I want to ask about the, the possibility of uh, leakage, like uh, special displacement of the uh, degradation if you implement policy in one area, and especially if the driver of deforestation or degradation in that area is related to the livelihoods of the people, well, that's okay, but if it is driven by some market-related uh, demand, then the demand should be met in one way. So. Those people, because they have committed to the program, they will not uh, degrade the forest, but other people will enter the market and in other areas it may have an effect. Absolutely. So when we come, uh, I didn't show the results from the deforestation uh, comparison for the impact analysis. So we look at georeference data, and one way to look at the leakage issue is to think of about these buffers of areas within areas that are enrolled in the, in the conservation program and a buffer area, in this case we use four kilometers, as a measurement of leakage. And before leakage, uh, and we look at prevented deforest deforestation, um, lands under the socio-bosque program were 10% less likely to be deforested. But once we control for leakage, that went down to 7%. So the leakage we identified using remote sense information was about 3% of the likelihood. But absolutely, that's very important. In degradation, that's much m that's more difficult to challenge, and that remains another research question to be to be examined. Yeah. Thanks, Amari. Yeah. Okay. Um, perhaps money is not everything in this. Uh, what it, What about you know the basic needs uh, for for people uh, owning this forest? For example, you show the charcoal production. It it sounds that that's a basic need for energy support, and. How is these uh, these factors playing uh, in in your analysis of the willingness to conserve? Yeah. So part of the one of the I, I guess the signals that we're receiving when people finally accept higher payments for conservation is now they can look at a compensation for not harvesting their timber, but also as a way to fulfill those li livelihoods with alternative sources, like could be in this case propane in Ecuador would be the more likely energy source, um, tank propanes. Um, 
going back to the uh, to the conception of uh, the, of the sociovoskir program, it, it was conceived indeed as a uh, conservation and poverty alleviation program. So when somebody accepts a payment, an individual or a community, one has to disclose a budget, and in the contract with the government, indicate how is the money going to be invested, especially at the community levels, because we have much more money being invested. Uh, common programs uh, where money is allocated into the community are uh, clinics, health clinics. Those are the top priority for them. The second one is to take some of the money that's being transferred from the government into improving schools. So those were the two main uh, forms of investment of how communities took these monies and decided to enhance their livelihoods. But absolutely. Energy didn't come perhaps as important to them. I would, I would probably guess based on observation, casual observation, that most people can probably f find firewood without being in violation of the program. It's sort of sparse enough, and it's not evident enough that can might still be happening, possibly. Yeah. Hey, uh, so how does the, the threshold of the compensation that they request compare to the foregone income, given your own study? You know, I, I wonder whether... <laughs> That whether we are seeing something interesting there. Yeah, so in this case, the estimated income that we looked at for an annual basis for the opportunity cost of the land was about 80 to 90. So once you go over and exceed that, then you see that sudden big enrollment. And again, the blue line is for refusal. So that when it drops, that means that more people are willing to enroll. So about, about that threshold that we found. Yeah, so b yeah, indeed, a lot of have to do with behavior. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting talk. And I, as a natural scientist, I truly see a lot of common interests here. Um, I was wondering regarding your, you had a bar chart there <laughs> with it. Yes. Um, unfortunately, nowadays, often it's not enough to just say, with this kind of management, we save X number of trees here. You need to go deeper into potential ecosystem services actually provided by the different species. Um, your two bars there with the trees at risk of extinction, for example. Have you looked into more detail what kind of potential services these trees can provide in terms of um, soil pre prevention for soil degradation, uh, medicine, w whatever? So thanks for the question, uh, Fagan. So in this case, we didn't look at the value of the ecosystem service per se. We look at the impact of the policy intervention. But we did a different study, and this was conducted in the US, for instance. And we, we found that in the case, if we were to dissect different ecosystem services from forest, uh, the one, one of the most valuables is wa water quality. Um, when it comes to things like habitat preservation or the su supply of adequate habitat, um, in terms of the value that we estimated was about 20% of that value of w as compared to water quality, so a fraction of that. Um, so in, in that case, I w we often use a different approaches. For, for this one, we could definitely look at ecosystem service values and the how, the e how the policy intervention can enhance ecosystem services. In this case, uh, we d again, we didn't do it for this one. One of the reasons, because there are very few um, Popula the population is very sparse in this area. So in terms of benefits like water quality, it's, it's not much. In terms of benefits of timber, or, or actually the disservice of the program, because the, service, the program is taking timber out, or is expected to take timber out of the system. So you can challenge, or you can argue that the livelihoods of many meals will be affected in the area. And uh, numbers suggest about 70% of the, of the timber market in the area is in fact coming from illegal sources. Um, so I guess to answer your question, so we didn't look at the specific trade-offs in ecosystem services for this example, but we have done it for other studies, and, and we have looked at uh, pr 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 possibly water quality being the most important one of the forests. But we can definitely talk about that after the seminar. Yeah, we're going to do, do a last uh, question yeah. here. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I think that money is not the only thing. Uh, education is also important because I come from India and I know uh, in, the, in the tribal areas especially, I mean, people need to be educated about forest conservation. And um, for example, like firewood, we should also, uh, they should be given some other options um, for that. I mean, 
Yeah. Thanks for the comment. And th the one thing I will add to that is I have learned not to not to take the role that we need. At times, it's not necessary to educate people. They know the value of their lands. At times, it's better to take the value away from timber and recognize that as a compensation. That's how I see money in this, in this context. Uh, perhaps the biggest education we can do is with consumers. These forest owners know the land, know, know their forests, and they're precious to them. But at times, it's the consumer. And, and uh, raising the awareness about deforestation and degradation and perhaps how certification can help prevent such products from entering a market, that carries a lot of value. So uh, your comment is absolutely right. The one thing I would probably emphasize is education on the consumer side uh, and, and the recognition that all these communities carry so much knowledge that I, in fact, I don't want to lose that. There's so much that knowledge that they have. Um, and um, yeah, it's the behavior. People, people are not bad. If people harvest timber most likely is because you have a health emergency. Somebody had to go to the hospital. And in the social systems in many of these countries, you have to pay out of pocket if you want to go have adequate service. And this is your bank account. So I, I don't see the de degradation uh, and I don't see the behavior of individuals engaging in that process. They're, they're not bad people. Uh, and in that regard, I think we have a responsibility as a society to help compensate for that. Uh, a little bit, and some of these programs can help as a mechanism mechanism for that to happen. Um, with that, uh, I think that was the last question, Olaf, right? So yes. I, I want to thank everyone for coming. There's soup right here. And also on the 28th of November, uh, we are having a little celebration um, of the 10th anniversary of the Center for Environmental and Resource Economics. So just as, as I have you here today, it will be so wonderful to have you on the 28th of November. 10 years of SETE is a great landmark. And with that, thanks again for coming. I'll be here around if you have any other questions. Thanks for, for your time.